Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Golden Harvest Community Church live stream. Wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you for being part of the service this morning. I believe you're going to be very blessed because the Holy Spirit has something on his heart that he wants to impart to you today. And I always look forward to that. The Holy Spirit is so precious. The word of life is full of life. It's full of truth. It shapes and guides us. It's a wonderful instrument in the hand of the Holy Spirit to help bring us into what our heart really sincerely longs for, and that is to walk in His ways, to be truly led by the Holy Spirit. And today He wants to lead us into green pastures. He wants to lead us beside restful waters. He wants to restore our soul. He wants to pour in the heartbeat and love of God the Father. So open up your hearts to receive because this is a very special moment you've entered into today as the Holy Spirit draws you closer to Himself. And as he speaks uh, a fresh word to your heart. So we're going to pray and we're going to jump straight on in. Um, I just want to spend the quality time in these scriptures today. It's going to be a little shorter than normal. I'm hoping and believing and trusting that we can pull this one in. I don't believe it needs to be long because it's a simple message, but so valid and so relevant, so important to where you and I are today. And what God's wanting to speak into this moment and even if this moment that you're watching this video isn't on this specific date that's on the video, it doesn't matter. You have connected with this video and this message for a very specific reason, for such a time as this. So welcome. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. That you've chosen us, that you've called us into your household, into your family, that you've brought us to yourself through Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for looking out for us. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for ministering to our deepest needs, Lord, and our simplest needs, that everything about our lives matters to you and that you would, you would shape us, you would direct us, you would undergird us, that you would protect and shelter and shield us, that you would prepare a way ahead of us, that you would make pre preparations for us in advance of every need. Father, we give you thanks and praise today and we ask you to speak by your spirit through the word of life in deeply into our hearts today in a way that's revolutionary, life transforming in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I have a key scripture that we're going to be referring back to today. It's in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 and 7. We're going to launch there and we're going to come back into it and, and refer back to it. It's our key, key passage for today. And there's basically two sections, verse 6 and verse 7. So let's jump on in and listen. Listen, not just with your ears today. Listen with your heart, okay? Seek the Lord, Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. So let's concentrate there. We're going to jump now to verse, just bring up verse 6 as a focus here. And this is where we'll start our, our message today. It's very simple, but deeply profound. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Would you say that word while with me? Seek the Lord while. What does that mean? It means a great many things. It's actually a very powerful word to be used in a sentence that's this big. This is a small sentence that is very, very big. Seek the Lord while. While what? While he may be found. Call on him while, say the word while with me again, while, call upon him, the Lord, while he is near. Now, the background to this message today is that, well, it'd be about three and a half years ago, plus or minus a little bit. Actually, plus a little bit. It could be getting closer to four, been in that range. God arrested me with, this, with these two verses uh, in, in just an amazing way. This, these two verses just kept colliding back with me and he just confirmed this in at least you know, three different ways that this I needed to stop and take stock of these two verses. 
And when I say take stock, I don't mean I needed to just review them, read them, get to know them so that I could stand here and preach. Because as ministers and teachers and preachers, we do seek God for a message to come and bring a message to you. But do you know he's still dealing with us day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, and things are being worked into our own lives. Okay, and this was one of those. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. And I said to the Lord, I said, um, Lord God, <laughs> I'm not sure I get this. You're everywhere all the time. Right? We call it omnipresent. So there's three words we use when we refer to God. Theologically, we say he is omnipotent. Omni is all, potent power. God has all power. Right? The scriptures say it, say it, Jesus said it, Angel Gabriel said it, there's nothing impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. So he has all power. Omnipotent, um, omniscient. And that's the word omni, all, scient, science, all knowledge. God has all knowledge. He has, knows the past, the present, and the future. He's written the book of Revelation, and he revealed the book of Revelation, events that haven't happened yet. He revealed them 2,000 years ago to young John. Well, actually, John was uh, probably up in his 90s by that stage. Or uh, yeah, late, his later years. He was a senior. John, was a, John the young disciple was a senior when he wrote the book of Revelation. So events that will still yet happen in our future, including a thousand years after the millennial reign, the 1,000 year reign of Christ, they are defined, spelt out in detail, that are at least a thousand plus years from now, and they were written 2,000 years ago. God knows everything. The psalmist David said, you know my next thought. You know the next word I'm going to speak before I even put it in my mouth. Okay, the Apostle Peter refers to the foreknowledge of God. And it's another topic. Maybe one day we'll get into it in more detail because it's deeply significant that God has foreknowledge. Jesus taught it in Matthew 6. He said, your heavenly, I think it's verse 18, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask. See that foreknowledge, omniscient, all knowledge, past, present, future. It's all the same to God. He's not trapped in time. He's not isolated in time or isolated by anything. He has all knowledge. He has all power. And then the third word we use, and they're all correct, they're all absolutely correct from the scripture, is that he's omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Jesus said a sparrow can't fall to the ground without your father knowing it's happened. And then he went on to say, aren't you worth far more than many sparrows? Rhetorical question, because the answer is obvious. So God has, God is present everywhere at all times. The psalmist said, where can I flee from your presence? Remember that psalm? I, I, I'm just thinking of it in the moment, so I can't reference it. Look it up. The psalmist said, David, it might have been David, he said, where can I flee from your presence? If I was to go into the bowels of the earth, you were there. Darkness is not even darkness to you. Darkness and light are just the same to you. You see me wherever I go. There's nowhere I can run. There's nowhere I can hide. I'm paraphrasing now. You're everywhere, even in the bowels of hell. If I was to, if I was to try and run and hide there, you, your eyes would see me. Okay. So that begs the question that I brought to the Lord and said, okay, uh, help me out here. It's really clear you want to tell, tell, talk to me through these verses. And he's talking to you today through these verses. All right. Seek the Lord while, while he may be found. Call on him while, during this period that he's near. And I said, Lord, you're present everywhere all the time. What could it possibly mean to call on him while he's near? And the Holy Spirit brought it alive to me. And I'm not saying it's the only interpretation. It's what I want to share with you today. There are many times that you and I have had an opportunity approach us and come into our world and come into our lives. And it's come, part, come to us and it's gone past us. And we've looked back on that opportunity and gone, if only. Am I the only one or has anybody else go, they've got an if only moment? Okay. So here's what I came to understand and listen very clearly and listen with your hearts. 
This message that God's speaking to you today and to me again fresh from Isaiah 55, 6 is this. The nearness is in the invitation. God is near to you in this moment even as we speak because he's near to you in the invitation. He has approached you. You have been connected with this message. You have been connected with this word today because God is speaking to you. He is calling you into something. Deep calls to deep. And because the Father is calling you, there is a moment. And we are now in that while. We are right now in that moment. You and I together today, as you listen and watch, you are in that moment with the Holy Spirit speaking to you and saying, seek the Lord. Come, draw near to God. James 4, 8. Draw near to God. Draw. There's an invitation that's coming to you right in this moment that says there's a deeper walk. There's a closer walk. There's something that God wants you to come into a place of nearness and intimacy with him that you've not experienced ever before or possibly tasted or peeked over the fence or looked through a crack in the fence. And God's saying, no, that's, that's no longer to be somebody else's experience. It's now to be your experience. He's calling you into a personal call that you would seek the Lord and so this invitation is going out to you from the heart of the Father. And that's why it's a while. We're in a moment that's right now called a while. Seek the Lord while he may be found. And the reason that it's a while is because if you allow this moment to pass you by, you will end up looking back on it. It won't mean that you won't be able to seek the Lord in the future. It won't mean that there might be another opportunity. But you will have missed this one this moment, this opportunity to come close, draw near to God and to come into something deeper. And you could look back, and I don't want you to, and I believe you will, if you're listening with your heart, you could look back and go, oh, Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let's, let's go into the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon goes under both titles and we're going to read a passage from chapter 5 let's do this together song of songs so, song of solomon or song of songs we're in the esv today chapter 5 we're starting at verse 2 and this is the beloved so just a little quick background is the song of songs is a love story it is definitely an allegory it's definitely talking about our relationship as the bride of Christ with the Lord Jesus Christ, it's about a love relationship. It's, it gets a bit hot and sexy. It's quite an amazing book. Even the, word, even the book of Proverbs I was listening to in the car today talks about sexual intimacy in a, you know, in a, tastefully, a tasteful way, but it, it's talking about you know, real, the real intimacy between a man and a woman. So as we jump into this, these first verses is the young lady who's deeply in love, as you'll see from her language, with this handsome, glorious young man who's a very manly man. He's, a, a, as you read the Song of Songs, you find out that he's a leader. He's a man of strength. He's not, a, he's not effeminate. He's not uh, metrosexual. He's not trying to do any of these things to, you know, it's not an image thing. She is deeply in love with this, this man and he is deeply in love with her. And so let's go into it. You'll find, the setting is that she has gone to bed and he turns up and is outside the door. So he's on his way past and he wants to come and say hello, right? He's, he's lovesick for her and he can't message her. There's no Facebook, there's no messenger, right? So his way was he's going he's gonna to have a... Um, on his way home, he's going to visit her and just tell her how, you know, look into her eyes and tell her how wonderful she is and all those wonderful things. You ready for this? Good. So the young lady says, I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound. My beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew and my locks with the drops of the night, he says. But she then goes on to say, I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I'd bathed my feet. How could I soil them? 
So she's in a dilemma. She hears her, her, her loved one at the door. That voice, it's him. And then she goes, but I'm in bed and I'm already in my sleepwear and I've already washed my feet, which was a big thing in their culture. You know, they, they walked around in sandals. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. So remember, you know, washing the feet's not a little thing. And I'm now in bed and, and ah, oh. and so she hesitates. Verse four, my beloved put his hand to the latch. So now he's trying to reach for the lock. And my heart was thrilled within me. Boom, changalang, boom, changalang, right? I arose to open to my beloved and my hands dripped with myrrh and my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. So she's got perfume on and she's also talking about um, the love that she was feeling in that moment. Verse six. I opened the door to my beloved, but my beloved had turned and gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. Verse 7. The watchmen found me as they went about the city. They beat me. They bruised me. They took away my veil, those watchmen of the walls. Wow. Wow. Here's a really graphic picture from the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, of a moment. A moment that the love, the beloved, the one she calls the beloved, had come. He'd come to meet with her. He'd come to connect with her. He'd come to express his love for her. He'd come because of his longing for her. And in that moment, she hesitated. And she had some excuses that are reasonable, relevant, valid. But when she looked back on the moment, was it worth it? When she looked back and had missed her moment, in her desperation, she actually went out into the streets and the result was she was actually um, beaten and mistreated by the, the, the watchmen who were out at night. And this world system is continuing, continuing its rampage against the body of Christ. It's continuing. The Antichrist spirit has cranked up and stoked up the fire of antagonism stoked up the fire of prejudice against the church of Jesus Christ, stoked up the fire in the community, in the world, in culture, in education, in every arena. The spirit of the age is looking to beat up Christians, to beat you down, to shut you up, to silence you, to abuse you, to humiliate you, to tear you apart and make you look like a fool and to shame you and to shame me for daring to have faith in the Lord God Almighty and his Christ, the Lord Jesus. But in the midst of all the madness that's happening in our world, in the midst of it all, is a call. A call to come deeper. A call to be drawn into the presence of our Lord God. A call to step into an intimate place, separate from the madness. We're going to jump to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. We know that Jesus spoke to uh, six different churches, or was it seven? Seven churches, sorry. Seven specific churches. Here's one of them. Each church had its own locality. Each church had its own <laughs> direct message from the CEO. Jesus Christ, Captain, King, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, speaking to his people and to each church he had a specific message let's read this one in revelation 3 14 and to the angel of the church in laodicea the word angel can also just mean messenger to the messenger or the angel of the church in laodicea write write the following the words of the amen the faithful and true witness the beginning of god's creation so that's jesus christ let's go 15 this is Jesus speaking. It's in quotes now. Jesus says, 
to this church, Christian people. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold or hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Why? For this reason, verse 17, for you say, I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to put on your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, says the Lord Jesus, I reprove, or another translation says rebuke, I reprove and discipline So be zealous and repent. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Does that sound familiar? Remember Song of Songs? He's reaching for the latch. He's wanting to connect. And Jesus now says, Revelation 3.20, Behold, look, I'm standing at the door. Can you hear me? I'm knocking. Can you see that I'm at your door? Can you hear me knocking? If anyone hears my voice, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. If anyone hears, if anyone hears, if anyone hears my voice, and responds by opening the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. Wow. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Here is Jesus Christ, the captain of the host, the Lord of lords, the king of kings, the head of of the church of Jesus Christ, and he's sending an appeal, a message, a very clear a very strong rebuke to Christian people in a church. And he says to them, you have been caught up in a system that tells you that you don't need me. You've become comfortable. You've figured it out for yourself. You are in a comfortable lifestyle. You feel like the system is working for you mostly. You feel like you're being able to manage this game on your own. And you have no need. But the truth is, the very fact that you believe all that means you're blind. The very fact that you believe that you can function and operate outside of me means you are blind. John chapter 15, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain connected, you will produce fruit and the Father will be glorified. If you disconnect, you will shrivel up and die. Jesus said it, John 15. And so he's saying to these people, and remember at the end he says, look, it's because of love that I am speaking to you so strongly right now. It's because I love you that I'm willing to rebuke you and to chastise you and to to bring you to a point of repentance. What does repent mean? Well, I've often said repentance just simply means you're on the wrong track. You discover that you're on the wrong track and then you make the choice to get off that road, that pathway, that track and find the right track, get yourself on that track and start moving in the right direction on the right track. That's what repentance means. It's not, I'm sorry. That's, that, that can be a beginning point. That can be a turning point. Remember the, the um, prodigal son. The scripture says that after he'd spent all his money, 
He's taking care of pigs. And remember, he's a Jewish boy and pig, they can't even eat pigs. Like pigs are like the lowest of low for them. He's not taking care of sheep or lambs. He's not a shepherd. He's taking care of pigs and he wished he could eat their food. He was, he was longing to eat the corn husks. He was that hungry and that desperate. And the scripture says, and he came to himself. So yes, repentance begins with that moment where we come to ourselves. There's a wake-up call. It's the mercy of God that says, what are you doing? Why are you my beloved child in this bog that you're in right now? I didn't send you here. This is not what I planned for you. This is not what I ordained, ordained for you. You're a son and a daughter of royalty. You're a son and a daughter of the majesty, the creator of heaven and earth. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, and this is not it. And so repentance can come with a rebuke that leads to a wake up that leads to a change of path, a change of direction. It really is very simply, to sum all that up, it's just getting back on the right path. Just getting back to where you're supposed to be. At the end of the book of Job, God speaks to Job and he says, get up off your, I'm paraphrasing, so please excuse me, get up off your butt. Clean yourself up, put on your princely robes and let's have a chat, Job, because I need to sort some things out of what you said about me and you're thinking about me and you've said some very stout words, Job. We're going to have a chat right now. But you get up, you clean up, and you put your royal robes on because I'm not going to talk with you while you're groveling around in the, the scunge. Welcome to church. You see, the love of God says, this is not what I planned for you. The love of God says, no, this is, this is not... This, you're, you are, you are not abiding in the vine. You are not abiding in my love. I love you. I want to love you. I want to pour out my love on you. I want to protect you and shelter you. And you're making dumb decisions. You're opening the door for the devil. You're making wrong choices. You are, you are leaving gaps in the wall. And when you get hit by that Mack truck or the thief comes in and he kills and he steals and he destroys, when the devourer comes and then you want to blame the majesty, the Lord God, when you want to say, where are you, God? How come? Why did you let this happen to me? Well, spit that out of your mouth right now and repent. Spit it out. Repent now. Spit it out and repent. You've spoken stoutly against the Lord. You believe the lies that the devil spoke and he said, has God really said? He just doesn't want you to, remember talking to Eve? He just doesn't want you to be like him. He's withholding from you. God's not after your best interests. Well, that's a lie. It's always been a lie. It's the first lie. Still a lie today, 6,000 years-ish later. So back to our starting point, Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord. I can't do that for you and you can't do that for me. And I could have got this message, which I did and it was very clear to me. And I hope it's clear to you today. And I could have missed it. It would have been easier to miss it because I've missed it many times in my life before. I can tell you that for sure. But this one, I recognised it. And I hope you recognise it today. Seek the Lord while he's talking to you. Seek the Lord while this sound is still in your ears make the decision come to your senses seek the lord while he may be found call on him while this moment is being presented to you don't wait till tonight don't wait till tomorrow don't have a new year's resolution do it today Seek the Lord while he's near. Well, King uh, David said, or the psalmist in 145 verse 18 said this. The Lord is near to all who call on him. And look what he says. He doesn't finish the sentence there. He says to all who call on him in, in what? Truth. 
when we get real, when you get real and I get real with God, do it today, do it now. When we get real, you put it on the table. You put your ugliness, your emptiness, your sin, your shame, your pain, your successes, your losses, your wins. You put it all on the table. Holding nothing back. And you call on him in truth. He will meet you as he already is through this message right now. He's speaking to you. Confirming and convicting. And he says this in Jeremiah 29. We know 29, 11. I quoted it already. I know the plans I have for you. But look, two verses later he says this. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and will find me. That's definite. It's absolute. When you seek me with all your heart. When have we sought him with all of our heart? You'll know. You'll know when it comes that time. You'll know when everything is on the line. When you are ready to do whatever it takes. Then you're seeking him with all your heart. When nobody and nothing can get between you and him. When he is your first and highest and central priority. And everything else has to take second, third, fourth, fifth and whatever other place. Everyone and everything. After him, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and his purpose for your life. At that point, you're beginning to seek the Lord with all of your heart. Jesus even requoted the commandments, or the, the first, he was asked the question about which is the most important commandment. And Jesus said, It's this one You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It doesn't leave anything out, does it? So let's move on to our second verse back in our original passage, Isaiah 55, verse 7. In this process of seeking, in the same paragraph, in the same sentence almost, he goes on to say, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return. Say the word return with me. Return. Say that again. Return to the Lord. He's not talking to ungodly people. It's a return. It's a return. Return means come back. What did the prodigal son do? First of all, he came to himself and then he returned. It was a long journey. He still stank of the stuff that he'd been messing around in. And it didn't matter to the father because the father says, my son was lost, but now he's found. Restore to him the robe. Restore to him the ring of authority. Restore to him the colours of the family. Restore his dignity. Put him back where he belongs, in my house, in my family. Because he was lost and now he's found. He was dead and he's alive again. And let him return to the Lord, comma, that. What does that mean? It means so that, in order that. He may have compassion. Isn't that what the prodigal, the father of the prodigal did? He saw him a long way off and had compassion on him and started to run. The old boy started to run towards his son who wasn't running. And there was a collision, but it wasn't a collision of confrontation. What did you do with my inheritance, you stinking little stink bag? There was no condemnation. There was no accusation. There was no judgment. The father saw that he was repentant. The father saw that he was returning home. The father ran to him and had compassion on him and embraced him and kissed him on the neck and, and, and just loved him back into wholeness, loved him back into his rightful place in the household and in the family. So I'm going to read the whole verse again now from the top. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God 
for he will abundantly, other translations say freely, he will abundantly pardon. What does pardon mean? Off the hook, forgiven, dealt with, let the, the past in the past. That's, what, that's why 1 Corinthians, talking about the love, says, love keeps no record of wrongs done to it. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Did you know the scripture, John says, God is love? It's probably 1 John. I know 1 John 1 says he's light, but John also says, God is love, and those who walk it, abide in love abide in God. So if love keeps no record of wrongs, that means that God keeps no record of wrongs. And I'm so grateful for that. And you know what? It also means that he points to me at times and has done and will continue to do so. And he'll remind me that he keeps no record of wrongs. And that means he's telling me and reminding me that I don't have the right or the privilege to keep records of other people's wrongs. I have to let it go. We have to let it go. We want our fathers to forgive us. We want him to let it go. We want him to keep no record. We want him to wash our sins away and, and, and cleanse away our sins as if they never happened. And he does if we come to him through the blood of Christ. And he requires the same of us. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion. Compassion. What's the entire motivation of this message? The compassion of God the loving kindness of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God. He's so, well, I'm gonna, I won't jump ahead of myself. I've got a wonderful verse coming in moments from now and you're gonna see this break open for you. The purpose that he's calling us to repent, to forsake, and what is he talking about? Our thoughts Let, and the unrighteous man, his thoughts, the messed up thinking. Yes, we all get assaulted in our thoughts. Look, there's an old Chinese proverb that fits just here right now. And it goes along the lines of, it says, look, you can't stop a bird from landing in your hair, but you can certainly stop it, I'm paraphrasing, but you can stop it from making a nest. You can stop the, like, you know, magpies in Australia, magpies are notorious for flying down and wanting to pluck hairs out, to put in, <laughs> do that sort of swooping on you and attack. Okay, you may not have known that was coming. You may not have known that bird was going to swoop on you, but you can sure prevent it from parking in your head and making a nest in your head. You get this? So this is the thing. Do, do you and I get assaulted with un, inappropriate, undesirable, unwelcome, unrighteous, ungodly thoughts? Oh yeah. They're called the fiery darts of the evil one. They're called the fiery darts. They're being thrown in the spirit and soul realm and they're being thrown into you to see if any of them will stick, in the, anyone will stick, if they'll stick, if we'll respond, if we'll react and set off a chain of events. But you don't have to react. I don't have to react. And if we do and we get caught up in it, we identify it, we recognize it, we go, oh, heck no, and we repent. And we do what the scripture says, we lead every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. We take captive every thought to obedience to Christ. How often? As often as you and I need to. It'll be daily and it'll be multiple times throughout the day. When we catch ourselves in wrong thinking, it's stinking thinking. It's only going in one direction. It's a downhill slope. It's real. It happens to every person. Don't take it as your own thoughts. Start to recognize that it's not originating with you. Don't accept it. Don't allow it to be your identity. Don't allow it to rule your decisions, your conversation, your choices, your attitudes, your behaviors, your responses. Don't get caught up in it. Learn to identify. Like David said, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? to begin to realize that there's an outside influence that was coming against his soul and he had to make a conscious choice and a conscious decision. He says, I will yet praise the Lord. Why are you cast down? I've made a decision to love and worship and praise my God and to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And so we realign. How often do we need to realign? Well, when you're traveling down the highway, the freeway, and you get a little bit distracted and you start to wander, you realign every time you wander. Better to keep our eyes on the road and don't touch that phone. <laughs> All 
All right, we've got two verses to close. Can you believe this? This has got to be a PB, a new record. Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, ESV. The Apostle Paul, I think, was preaching at this particular moment. And he says this, Repent, therefore, and turn again. Say again. <laughs> again. Repent for and then turn again. Again? It means this has happened before. <laughs> this has happened before. How many times do we need to repent? Well, as often as we need to. All right. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. The Lord wants to refresh you. He wants to pour out his compassion on you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to wash away the stain and the shame that's been accumulating through wrong thinking, wrong choices, mistakes, errors, stumbling, falling, being beaten up like the, the, the uh, young woman she got beaten up by the world around her. And the world system is, is, is intent on that because it's anti-Christ and you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world and you are the city set on a hill and you are the representation, the very body, the very hands and feet and expression of Christ. The Apostle Paul says, don't you see that we, our very lives are letters that are written Living letters, our, body, our very lives are letters from heaven that people are reading our lives. They're looking at you. They're looking at me. They're reading us. Yes, they're sussing us out. Yes, they're checking us out. Yes, they can see our weaknesses, but they're looking. Why are they looking so intently? Because they genuinely want it. If it's real, if we can show them and demonstrate that it's real, they want it. There's a hunger in their heart for more. There's a hunger in their heart for Christ, though they don't know it's for Christ. It's there for their creator and their sustainer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the author of life. Peter called him in one of his massive sermons in Acts 4, I think it is. The author of life. Jesus Christ, the author of life. Repent, therefore, and turn again. Again. Oh, yeah, but I've been here before. Yeah, well, so have I. So turn again. Why wait another day? Why? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. In this moment, make this a turning point for your life. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Oh, wow, I looked up that word, and it's, um, it's literally, it's not even like, we, if we put liquid paper, you know, liquid paper could sort of flake off, and you can still end up finding the original thing that's under there. No, th this word in the original language is actually about um, scraping or scrubbing something so that there's no trace left. It even uses that of, about um, people whose names become blotted out of the book of life in Revelation. It's very scary. But there will be people whose names are in the book of life and they will have their names scrubbed out. There will there'll be no trace. When the, the roll is called, their name will not be on that roll. It's very, it's very serious. So it says, so that your sins may be scrubbed out so in other words when somebody goes to look at your record it's not there like it's not there in in the in the legal terms we call it expunged ever heard that phrase it's kind of a funny phrase but it basically means uh, for various reasons uh, the, i believe donald trump did it for someone who was probably wrongfully jailed but um a person's record can be expunged. In other words, if they were ever to face a judge again, a jury again, or any other legal situation, and their file was pulled, all record of whatever it was that they were previously accused of, or possibly even sentenced for, is absolutely erased. It's not on record anymore. Isn't that what he said? Return to the Lord, for he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. So here's where we're at today. Those whom I love, <laughs> my love for you, Jesus says, is so strong that I'm willing to speak to you in a way that you didn't expect. 
I'm willing to shake some things and speak very firmly and very strongly to you as a parent would to a child. To rebuke you if necessary. To grab your attention and say, what are you doing? And it's because of my love for you. And by the way, if you'll recognise the moment, you'll hear me knocking. If you recognise the moment, you'll understand that I'm on the outside, so wanting to come in, that I want to come in. I want to be with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to eat with you. I want to share my heart with you. I want us to be together. Can you hear me knocking? The last verse is from the Amplified Classic. does a brilliant job once again. This is from Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, and this is where we finish today. For thus says, said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, what did God say? He said this, in returning to me and resting in me, you shall be saved and in quietness and trusting confidence shall be your strength. Where does true strength come from? Abiding in him. Being so reliant on him that you realise that without him, Jesus, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. John 15. A place of humility, a place of surrender, a place of vulnerability. None of us like to be vulnerable. We have so many protective defense mechanisms so often that they even get between us and the Lord. And today is the day to be vulnerable again, to be repentant again, to humble our hearts again, to seek the Lord with our whole heart, to call on him while he's near. Because he wants to bring refreshing. He wants to fellowship. He wants to commune. He is a jealous God. And he loves us with a passion. And he hates the things that get between us and him. He hates those things that have snuck in and created barriers and walls and a sense of distancing from his presence and from his love. He loves you deeply. He loves you dearly. He loves you passionately. And he's calling you to himself in a fresh and a beautiful way today. Will you come? And if you've never ever experienced meeting with God, if you're not returning to the Lord because you've never been, you can't return somewhere you've never been. If you don't know him that way, if you've never met Jesus Christ as a personal saviour, a personal relationship, then God is calling you into that today. It's absolutely no coincidence that you are listening right now and that you even made it to the end of this message. God wants you in his family. He wants you close to him. He's calling you, and he's calling you with deep compassion and a love and a tenderness that your heart has never experienced before. And if that's you right now, I want to, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer to allow you to connect. The, the connection's already begun. It's because it's not about me, and it's not about videos, and it's got nothing to do with that. It's about God's heart for you. So right now, we want to, we want to just seal that by coming to him and inviting him to come into our hearts by the Holy Spirit and to begin to direct your life from this moment on in, re in union with him. If you're ready for that, let's pray this simple prayer together. I'll say a phrase, you just repeat it, make it your own. Take ownership of these words as your own and experience the fullness of what God has for you. So let's do this together. Father God, Thank you that you care about me. That you've taken the time to talk to me today. And you're inviting me to come into your family. And I'm coming right now. Please forgive me for everything that has got between me and you. I let it go in Jesus' name. Forgive me, cleanse me, and fill me now with your own Holy Spirit. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Lead me and direct me from this moment on. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. We would love to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. If you prayed that prayer, connect with a local church who love God and are seeking him with all their hearts. If you're in the local area, we'd love to see you come and visit us. Come and be with us. We'd love to see, see you and, and to welcome you. Contact us. We can provide you with resources. If you don't yet have a Bible or a New Testament, we will make that available to you. Just contact. Now, we've got uh, through the Facebook, of course, you can message us directly, a DM. You can private message us. There's Messenger there and also Sandy's details, her phone number there. There are mul multiple ways to connect with us. Please take the time to connect. We would love to love you, support you, encourage you in your walk with the Lord. That's what he's assigned us to do. That's why we're here in this community right now. It's God's plan. So I just bless you. I speak favor and grace upon you today that your week ahead will be very significant as this message starts to outwork in a really practical sense, as there's a realignment that's happening. You can't even see the fullness of it right now, but it's really big. And it's a realignment that's positioning you for a, a very swift advance. So this is not a long drawn out process. When we get, this, when we get these things right and we reconnect, there's a, pro a propelling forward in the spirit, in God's purpose. So look forward to that. Be expectant that things are going to change. Things that have been awkward and, and obstacles and roadblocks and hindrances and all this clutter around you, as you're getting this right today, you will see that you are about to navigate through things that you never thought you would get past. In Jesus' name, hear the word of the Lord. That's for you. Take it to heart and be blessed. Enjoy your week. And we will see you again next week. God bless.